Chapter Nine of Tilda Jane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter Nine: Lost in the Woods. Nothing could be more exquisitely beautiful than that winter morning in the Maine woods. The white glory of the snow, the stealing pink and gold glances of the sun, the bravery of the trees proudly rearing their heads aloft and stretching out their heavily laden arms, all made a picture that filled with awe even the heart of rough Bob Lucas, unregistered guide and nominal lumberman, noted for his skill as hunter and poacher, and his queer mingling of honesty, law-breaking, piety, and profanity. No, it was not a picture, it was reality, and he was a part of it. He was in it. He belonged to this glorious morning. The morning belonged to him, and he put up his hand and pulled off his cap. "'Branching candlesticks on the altar of the Lord,' he muttered, as he surveyed the trees. "'I feel like a vessel of grace. More's the pity I can't take on the actions of one.' He stood lounging in the cabin door, red-haired, long-nosed, unkempt, and stalwart. Inside were his two sons getting the breakfast, and the appetizing odor of frying bacon floated out on the fresh air. "'Hi, Poacher, what's up with you?' he suddenly exclaimed, and his gaze went to a deer-hound of unusually sturdy build, who was plowing through the snow toward the cabin. The dog wagged his tail, advanced, and lifting toward him a countenance so bright with intelligence that it might almost be called human, opened his mouth and dropped something at his master's feet. "'Hello, boys,' said the man, stepping inside the cabin. "'What in the name of creation's this? "'I call it a morsel of woman's togs. "'Don't your mother wear aprons like it or something?' The two strapping lads in high boots and woolen shirts turned their red faces from the fireplace. "'Yes, sirree,' said the taller of them, fingering the scrap of cotton. "'They call it something like Jingo.' "'Gingham, you gull,' interposed his brother, with a guffaw of laughter. "'I've seen it in the stores.' "'Where'd you get it, Pop?' "'Poacher fetched it. "'When I got out of my bunk this morning and opened the door, "'he put up that old muzzle of his and gave a sniff. "'Then off he sought. "'I knew he'd got something on his mind. "'He's been running deer, and he found this on his way back.' "'He's a beaut,' said the other lad, eyeing him admiringly. "'He's nosed out something. "'What'll you do, Pop?' "'Swaller some breakfast and make tracks for Morse's camp.' "'Spose it was some person,' said the younger of the boys, uneasily. "'By gum!' and the man suddenly smote his thigh. "'Spose the old woman had run after us with something. "'Hustle on your coats, boys. Maybe it's your ma.' The faces of both boys had turned white, and their hands were shaking. Seizing their coats, they rushed out of the cabin. "'Pop, it wasn't bitter last night,' said the younger, in a hushed voice. "'Shut up,' said his father irritably and in profound silence the three proceeded through the wood in single file, following the dog who, without excitement but with his dark face beaming with pleasure at being understood, rapidly led them over his own tracks of a few minutes previous. Mile after mile they went in silence, until at last the father who was leading made a leap forward. There was a dark mound on the snow against a tree-trunk, and dropping beside it he turned it over. "'Thank the Lord!' he ejaculated, while scratching and beating the snow away from it. "'It ain't what I feared.' "'Why, it's only a gal,' said one of the boys. "'Is she gone, Pop?' "'Here, shake her up,' he replied. "'What's this she's curled round? "'A dog, sure as thunder, and alive and warm. "'Merciful grindstones, look at him!' Irritably stepping out of wrappings, consisting of a small tippet and a shawl, was a little old dog, the most utter contrast to the handsome deer-hound that could have been imagined. The hound stared inquiringly and politely at Gippie, and being a denizen of the woods made the first overtures to friendship, by politely touching him with the end of his muzzle. The smaller dog snapped at him, whereupon the hound withdrew in dignified silence and watched his owners, who were making vigorous efforts to restore the benumbed girl. "'Her heart's beaten,' said Lucas, putting his hand on it. "'The dog lay there and kept it warm.' "'Rub her feet. Rub harder,' he said to his sons, while he himself began chafing Tilda Jane's wrists. "'She's just the age of your sister Min. Suppose she was here stone-cold and half-dead.' The boys redoubled their efforts at resuscitation, and presently a faint color appeared in the little girl's marble cheeks, and the cold lips slightly moved. 
Lucas put his head down. What you sayin'? Dog, is it? He's all right. If you'd wrapped yourself more, and him less, it might have been better. Yet I guess not. If it hadn't been for the dog, you'd have been dead. Put on her shoes, boys. We'll carry her to that heap of logs of ours. Pop, will one of us have to show her out? said Joe, anxiously pressing beside him. Yep, said his father. Here, strip off your coat and put it round her. And I suppose I'll have to go, cause I'm the youngest, said the boy, bitterly. No, sir, you're always doing dirty work. This time it'll be Zebedee. Zebedee frowned and muttered that he wished girls would stay out of the woods. Then he tramped on beside his brother. Here, give me my gun, said Lucas presently. Ewan's is younger. You can carry the gal. He had been carrying Tilda Jane over his shoulder, and now the little procession started again, this time with the boys bearing the semi-unconscious burden. Gippy, squealing and complaining, followed behind as well as he was able, but finally becoming stuck in a drift, gave a despairing yell and disappeared. Lucas turned around, went in the direction of the crooked tail sticking up from the snow, and pulling him out, contemptuously took him under his arm. "'If you was my dog, you'd get a bullet to eat. Howsomever, you ain't, and I guess we'll have to keep you for the little gal. Get on there, sons.' Two hours later, Tilda Jane opened her eyes on a new world. Where had her adventures brought her this time? Had she died and gone to heaven? No, this must be earth, for she had just heard a string of very bad words uttered by someone near her. But she could not think about anything. A feeling of delicious languor overpowered her, and slowly opening and shutting her eyes, she little by little allowed her surroundings to impress themselves upon her. She was very warm and comfortable. She was sitting on the floor, propped against the wall, by means of an overturned chair and blankets. A fire in an open fireplace blazed beside her. Gippy was making his toilet before this fire, and she was very happy. "'Here, sup this,' someone said, and languidly lifting her eyelids she saw a big red-haired man bending over her. He was holding a cup to her lips. Coffee sweetened with molasses, just what they used to have at the asylum, and with a faint smile and a feeble, "'Thank you, sir,' She slowly swallowed it. "'I was scared to give you any before,' he said gruffly. "'Thought you might choke. "'Here, give me some grub, sons.' Tilda Jane felt a morsel of something put in her mouth. It was followed by another morsel of something hot and savoury, and speedily she felt new life in her veins. She could sit up now and look about her. "'Guess you can feed yourself,' said the man, going back to the table. "'Fall to now. You most got to the end of your tether.' Tilda Jane took the two-pronged fork he put in her hand, and began to eat with slow avidity, not disregarding the requests for tidbits from her dog, who occasionally paused for that purpose in his endeavours to lick himself dry. At intervals she cast a glance at the centre of the cabin, where a man and two boys were seated at a rough table. These must be her rescuers. She had fallen down in the snow the night before. Not even her fear of death had been able to keep her on her feet. She stopped eating. "'Who be you?' "'We be lumbermen, when the fit takes us,' said the man shortly. "'Well,' said Tilda Jane, "'I guess—' Then she stopped, overpowered by intense feeling. "'I guess,' she went on finally, "'that there wouldn't have been much of me this morning if it hadn't been for you coming. "'Twasn't us,' said the man agreeably. "'Twas Poacher there.' And he indicated the dog under the table, who at the mention of his name rose and walked politely toward the girl. He looked at her, and she looked at him. Then he took a step nearer and laid his muzzle on her shoulder. With exquisite subtlety he comprehended all that she wished to say in relation to himself, and all that she felt in relation to the dog race in general. She laid her cheek against his velvet ear, then her arm stole around his neck. The dog stood in courteous silence, until, feeling embarrassed under her attention, he looked somewhat foolishly at his master, and appealingly licked Tilda Jane's cheek. As quick to understand him as he was to understand her, she released him, whereupon he lay down beside her and put his handsome head on her lap. Gippy extended his muzzle, sniffed suspiciously, then, his short-sighted eyes discovering the presence of a rival, he advanced, snapping. The large dog generously averted his head, and Gippy, seeing that he was not to be dislodged, meanly curled himself up on Poacher's glossy back. "'Yes, that's a boss dog,' the man went on. "'Search the state from Fort Kent to Kittery Depot, and you'll not find a cuter. "'He's given me pointers many a time. 
Where you hail from, little girl? I'm going to Ciscasset, she said dreamily. Her mind was running back to the night before, and unaware that she was holding a piece of bacon poised on her fork, in tempting proximity to Poacher's nose, she stared intently at the fire. She had been near death. Had she been near the heaven that the matron and the lady boards pictured, or would it have been the other place, on account of her disobedience? The soul that sinneth it shall die. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Keep thyself pure. For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. That meant without the city the beautiful city of gold where her mother probably was, and many of her unknown relatives, and where all good matrons, orphans, and lady boards went. "'I guess I'd been without, with no comfort but the dogs,' she thought bitterly, and pushing away her plate she said aloud, "'I thank ye kindly, but I can't swallow her another morsel.' A roar of laughter saluted her ears. Gippie's inquiring muzzle had scented out the bacon and had seized it, whereupon Poacher, knowing that it was not intended for him, had gently but firmly taken it from him, and was walking about the cabin holding it aloft while Gippy snarled at his heels. Tilda Jane paid no attention to them. The greater matter of her soul's destiny was under consideration. "'Are you an extra good man?' she abruptly asked her host. He stopped laughing, and a shadow came over his face. Then his glance went to his boys. "'What you say, sons?' The boys stared at each other, avoided his eye, and said uneasily, "'Of course you be, Pop. Don't make game.' "'Make game,' repeated the man strangely. "'Make game.' Then he laughed shortly, and made another onslaught on the bacon and bread. "'Cause I'm looking for an extra good person,' went on Tilda Jane brusquely. "'Someone that won't blab, and that I can tell a story to.' "'Well, there ain't no extra good persons in the woods,' said her host. We be only ordinary. You better wait till you get out. What was you doin' so far from houses last night, little gal, instead of being tucked snug in bed? I might as well tell the truth, she said helplessly. I'm tired of lies. I was running away from something, but whether my running was good or bad is what I can't make out. While you're puzzlin', you eat some more breakfast, said the man, getting up and putting another supply of bacon on her plate. You've got to call up strength to get out. Suppose you don't know you're some miles from sofas and pianos and easy chairs. I didn't know where I was going, she said apologetically, or what I was coming to. I just traveled on and on. Then I begun to get queery, and I left the road. Thinks I, there'll be all kind animiles in the woods. Maybe I'll meet a nice black bear, and he'll say, Little girl, you're lost, and I'll lead you to my den. We'll be happy to have you and your little dog, and I'll not let no one eat him and I'll give a big party and invite all the foxes and deer and bears and squirrels, cause you're fond of wild beasts, little girl. And it seemed I'd come to the bear's den, and there was a soft bed, and I just lay down and was going to sleep when I thought, maybe if I sleep, some little bird'll tell him I'm a baddie, and he'll eat me up, and I felt just awful. Then I forgot everything till I woke up here. I guess I'm obliged to you. The lumberman was about to reply to her when one of the boys ejaculated, Hist, Pop! Look at Poacher! End of chapter 9、Chapter、ten of Tilda Jane This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter X Among Friends. The animal had gone to the door and stood in a listening attitude. Someone's coming, said the boy. Is everything snug? The three cast hurried glances around the room, then, shaking off a somewhat uneasy expression, the man stepped to the one and only window of the cabin. Game Warden Perch, he said dryly, and registered guide Hersey. Come and spine round. Bad luck to him. And he sulkily went back to the table. Presently there came a knocking at the door. Come in, bawled Lucas, not inhospitably, and two men much smarter, cleaner, and 
more dapper looking than the red-haired man and his sons entered the cabin howdy they said simultaneously as they stood their guns and snowshoes against the wall and took possession of the two boxes vacated by the boys at a sign from their father then with an appearance of enjoyment they dragged the boxes near the fire and stretched out their hands to the blaze tilda jane saw that they were staring in unmitigated astonishment at her and with a feeling that she herself was out of the world and in a place where passers-by were few and infrequent she examined them in equal interest where'd you come from asked the elder of them at last fixing her with a pair of piercing eyes she got keeled over on the old road last night spoke up lucas much to her relief lost her way dog here found her and he motioned toward poacher who was surveying the newcomers in cold curiosity warden perch's attention being drawn to the dog he stared at him earnestly then turned to his companion ever see that animal before not near at hand said the other with a slight sneer guess i've seen his hind legs and the tip of his tail once or twice have some breakfast said lucas who was imperturbably going on with his own warden perch inspected the table not on bacon haven't you got something more uncommon we've got some beans in thar said lucas with a backward nod of his head toward a bag on the floor coarse brown beans they might be a treat for ye seeing and ye don't get em much in hotels perch flushed angrily and opened his mouth as if to make a retort then he drew a blank book from his pocket and to calm himself ran his eye over the report he was making for the game commissioner of the state left nexter ten fifty five a m march first for bluefield march second at bearville eleven thirty a m jim green's camp lake clear at four thirty five p m march third left camp at seven a m bill emerson's camp nine forty seven a m reached moose yard on backside fernberg ridge one forty seven p m three moose in yard henry he said lifting his head and abruptly addressing his companion some of those poachers have mighty cute tricks henry nodded assent those fellows at hack mactack station tried hard to fool us last week cut the legs off the deer then got a couple of bear's feet and had the bone of the bear's leg slipped up under the skin on the leg of the deer then they put them up so slyly in three layers of bagging with nothing but bear's feet sticking out but i caught on to those bear's legs and said the feet weren't big enough so i had it opened and took the deer and the fellows to matawamkig and i guess they think forty dollars apiece was just about enough for a fine lucas and his sons burst out laughing and tilda jane shrewdly suspected by their amused faces and knowing glances that they had heard the story before there was no love lost between these newcomers and her preservers and lucas and his sons would be glad when their callers left the cabin but what was all this talk about deer surely they did not kill the pretty creatures whom without having seen she loved she cleared her throat and in a weak little voice addressed the game warden sir i've got pictures in my geography of deer with branching horns does bad men kill them warden perch gave her another alert glance here was no confederate of poachers yes he said severely bad men do kill them and dogs chase them but mind this young girl poachers get nabbed in the long run they slide for a time but there's a trip up at the end and they're dogs too i've shot three hounds this week for dog and deer you've shot dogs repeated tilda jane in a horrified tone and pressing gippie closer to her if i didn't shoot them they'd kill the deer said the man irritably 
oh murmured tilda jane here was one of the mysteries of nature that was quite beyond her comprehension the dog hunted the deer and the man hunted the dog the deer apparently was the weaker one and she must inquire into the matter what does bad men kill deer for she asked timidly haven't you ever eaten any deer meat asked the warden i didn't know it was good to eat she said sadly you haven't had any here in this cabin i guess not unless i might a eat it when i was fainty lucas eyed her peculiarly and the meaning of the warden's question and offensive manner burst upon her that's a good man she said indignantly starting from her half reclining position and pointing to lucas i guess men that takes little girls out of snowbanks don't kill deer warden perch laughed and rose from his seat he had very little sentiment with regard to the animal creation i calculate we'd better be moving he said to the guide don't suppose we'd see anything to keep us here unless we'd hang on for the big snowstorm they say is coming and that i expect you're waiting for and he looked at lucas me and my son said the latter coolly is on our way to david morse's lumber camp two of his hands had to come out count a sickness we lay out to get thar this evening was late in startin last night and camped here we'll have to get this leetle girl out thought you might undertake it seein as you've makin for outside i suppose get your own find out said the warden severely it'll keep you out of mischief and look here if i find that dog of yours up to tricks you know what i'll do shoot him on sight said lucas stoopin and pattin the animal who was pressing close to him but you'll never catch him cause he ain't the sort of dog to be catched in any kind of mischief hey poacher the guide went out and the warden with a scowl followed slamming the door after him lucas and his sons crowded to the window to see their callers depart and when they were fairly out of sight they burst into relieved laughter and noisily drew their boxes up to the fire say pop ain't he mad remarked joe excitedly mad cause you're too cute for him he'd give his teeth to fasten something on to you shut up said his father with a roll of his eye toward tilda jane the girl was puzzled lucas who seemed a nice man was treated as if he were not a friend to the deer while the departed ones whom she did not like at all seemed to be their protectors who are these men she asked curiously well i'll tell you said lucas taking two moose-ear skins from his pocket and fitting them together to make a tobacco pouch them two is fancy game men the warden and the guide likes to lounge in easy chairs round hotels and tell of their doings in the woods how the poachers tremble and run when they see em a comin as a rule they don't take to the woods till they're druv to it by some complaint then they're awful fierce and growl and show their teeth and run home nobody don't care nothin for em are there many men killing deer asked the little girl falteringly many men groaned lucas law me what a question last year little gal there was awful heavy snow eight foot deep in franklin county seven foot in somerset piscataquis penobscot and aroostook what a year for big game they couldn't get away they was as helpless as sheep storm came on storm till we was walkin up among the tree branches and knockin off the snow with a stick snow-covered tracks and poachers took possession o the earth they lived high in the lumber camps pop do you mind said zebedee smack at his lips when a fellow was starvin the smell just come out to meet em you bet only you wasn't thar to smell it said his father sharply you mind that 
you young ones takes to the woods too natural he surveyed them with mingled pride and dissatisfaction then came back to his reminiscences i vum that was a winter but the deer would a starved if they hadn't been shot for the snow was so deep that they couldn't get to their food that their perch made a great flurry about getting in and driving six deer to a swamp where they could get green stuff but i don't believe a word of it i believe he shot and ate them do you mind the deer that was dogged into our yard pop exclaimed joe i saw em as they crossed the river dog not fifteen foot behind and what became of that deer asked tilda jane unsteadily lucas winked at his sons and concluded the story himself he run across our yard and among the bark pilers at meek and son's tannery when the animal come running down between the bark piles some of the crew was for killin em but i was workin thar and i wouldn't let him he stayed round close to us all day and when any dog come in sniffed at him he'd run up close and tremble and ask us to see fair play you kill that deer exclaimed tilda jane bursting into tears oh why does god let men be so wicked sobs were almost tearing her little lean frame to pieces she had not worked up gradually to a pitch of emotion but had fallen immediately into it and lucas and his sons stared wonderingly at her poor little girl she looked as if she had come through a sea of troubles and pity stirred in the man's rough but not unkindly breast shut up now shut up missy he said soothingly we did shoot that feller but there weren't nowhere to keep him but deer has been kept soft now and i'll tell ye of seth winthrop who has a park and is a rich man last year when you couldn't go scarce five mile without seeing tracks of blood in the snow where someone had been slaughterin a moose was chased near winthrop's place he was so dead beat that he just stood and trembled and one of winthrop's men put a halter on him and led him to the barnyard and give him fodder and drink and that livin young moose is in winthrop's park to-day and he weighs four hundred pound tilda jane was still sobbin and joe nudged his father tell her about the bear pop now here's something that'll make you laugh said lucas kindly it's about a bad bear that went and got drunk i was on a fishing trip and i had a jug of black strap with me know what that is little gal no gasped tilda jane who rather ashamed of her emotion was trying to sober herself well it's the state o main name for rum and molasses mixed and you take it with you in case you get sick there was some other men with me and they'd gone off in a boat on the lake i had a gun but pon my word i didn't think of using it account of gratitude to that bar for giving me such a treat just as good as the circus well i must tell you how it happened i didn't feel well that day had a kind of pain and i was lying on the bank in the sun foolin and wishin i was all right by and by thinks i i'll go to the camp and have a drink o black strap i was most thar when i met a wicked thief bar comin out powers around he was as tipsy as a tinker he'd been at my black strap and i wish you could have seen him he didn't know where he was at or where he wanted to be at and he was jolly and friendly and seesawed round me and rolled and swaggered till i thought i'd die laughin my pain went like last year's snow and i walked after that bar till he was out of sight just like a drunken man he was making for home and in the midst of all this foolery 
haven't an idea of where he ought to go i'd have given a good deal to see mrs barr's face when he arrove and didn't those other fellers give it to me for not shooting him i said i couldn't take a mean advantage of his situation tilda jane's face was composed now and with a faint smile she reverted to the subject of the deer don't you feel bad when you're killing them and they looks at you with their big eyes look here leetle gal don't you talk no more about them or you'll have me as much hearted as you be said lucas getting up and going to the window at present i ain't got no feelin bout deer except that what's in the woods is ours you just stand up and try your feet it's gonna snow and i'd like to get you out of here did you ever try to teeter along on snowshoes no sir she said getting up and walking across the room lucas was anxiously surveying the sky here's like it was gonna snow any minute the last thaw took the heft of it off the ground you'd have never got in this fur if it hadn't and we're bound to have another big fall it ain't fur to the road and i guess you and zebedee better start let me see you walk says he tilda jane tottered back to her seat it's a smart trot home observed zebedee do you think she could foot it pop it's snowing now said joe who had taken his father's place at the window with almost incredible rapidity there had been a change in the weather a small and sullen cloud had hidden the dreamy thoughtful sun and out of the cloud came wheeling choking gusts bearing bewildered snowflakes up and down hither and thither before allowing them to alight turbulently upon the quiet earth that's quick muttered lucas philosophically we'll have to put off opinions till it's over and he again sat down by the fire the wind tore around the small cabin furiously seeking an entrance but finding none outside at least he could have his will and his vengeance fell upon the sturdy young firs and spruces who at this fierce word of command threw off their burdens of snow and bent and swayed before his wrath as wildly as the most graceful hardwood saplings the older trees bent more reluctantly they had seen many winters many storms yet occasionally a groan burst from them as the raging breath of the wind monster blew around some decaying giant and hurling him to the ground tilda jane pictured the scene without and cowered closer to the fire gippie was on her lap poacher beside her and this man with his two boys who at present personified her best friends in the world were safe and warm in their shelter her dark face cleared and in dreamy content she listened to the string of hunting stories reeled off by the two boys who without addressing her directly were evidently stimulated by the knowledge that here was an interested appreciative and brand new listener end of chapter 10 recording by john brandon chapter 11 of tilda jane this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon tilda jane by marshall saunders chapter 11 a sudden resolution the storm did not abate all day long it raged around the cabin and the four prisoners talked ate 
and drank without grumbling at their captivity when bedtime approached lucas addressed tilda jane in an apologetic manner you see we ain't used to havin leetle gals and i'm afeard we can't make you very comfy as my old woman says but we'll do the best we kin this room's all we've got but i'm gonna try to make it too see here and rising he went to one of the rough bunks built against the wall opposite the fire i'm going to drape ye off a place for yourself and dog and hanging a blanket on a hook by the fireplace he called loudly for a nail to drive in the logs across the corner the two boys who were playing cards at the table jumped up and presently tilda jane had a snug corner to herself lucas had dragged out one of the fragrant fur beds from one of the bunks the rustling of the evergreen inside reminded her of her narrow straw bed at the orphanage and drawing the blanket over her she nestled down and patiently waited for her friends to seek their equally fragrant couches she was very sleepy but she must not drop off until she had said her prayers it never occurred to her to repeat them to herself she must get up and say them aloud and upon her knees after some time there was silence outside her screen except for the heavy breathing of the sleepers and the slow deliberate crackling of the fire over the fresh wood heaped upon it by lucas she crept quietly from her bed and knelt down dear father in heaven i thank thee for saving my life i might have been dead at this minute if thou hadst not sent that good dog to find me please make me a better girl for being saved i'll take good care of that old man if thou wilt let me find him bless the red-haired man that owns this cabin i guess he is a good man lord but if he kills deer wilt thou not lay on his heart a coal from thy altar if he was a deer he would not like to be killed bless him dear father in heaven and his two boys and bless me and gippy and poacher and keep us safe for evermore and bless the lady boards and the matron and all the little orphans and let them find good homes and get out of the asylum lord i will write them a letter as soon as i get settled and confess what is wickedness and what ain't i don't want to be a bad little girl i want to live straight and go to heaven when i die but i'm sorry i had to begin in a asylum it ain't a place for children what likes animiles for jesus sake amen with a relieved sigh tilda jane crept back to bed and went to sleep quite unaware that her petition had awakened lucas who slept as lightly as a cat she had waked him and now he could not go to sleep for a long time he lay motionless in his bunk then softly getting up he seated himself on one of the boxes before the fire and let his head sink on his hands years ago he had a deeply religious mother one who would rise at dead of night and pray earnestly for her children tilda jane's childish prayer had brought this mother back from her grave what a good woman she had been dying wind sobbing and sighing without called to mind the camp meetings that he used to attend when he was a boy churches were few and far between and it was the event of the year for the scattered religious people to gather together under the pines 
for out-of-door services he could hear the women singing now the weird sound of their voices floated down the chimney surely he was among them again that good religious crowd he shook himself muttered an impatient exclamation and went back to bed no they were mostly dead his mother was in heaven and he was a hard impenitent man but his children something ought to be done about them this little girl had stirred these old memories zebedee and joe must quit this life and with a snarl of determination on his brow he turned over and fell into a profound and resolved slumber early the next morning tilda jane heard someone stirring quietly about the cabin she peeped from behind the screen and found that it was the father of the boys he was making coffee and taking dishes from a shelf to set them on the small table he was also frying meat tilda jane did not like to venture out until the boys had made their toilet which they presently did by springing from the beds drawing on their boots and smoothing their thick locks with a piece of comb that reposed on a small shelf near a broken looking-glass when they had finished she piped through the screen will you please give me a lend o the comb it was politely handed to her and in a short time she made her appearance oh deer's meat said joe sniffing joyfully where'd you get it pop found half a carcass leaning agin the door this morning he said briefly some of the boys must a left it on their way out remarked zebedee hard blow to travel in give me some pop lucas had settled himself at the table and was eating with every appearance of enjoyment nop he said pausing and speaking with his mouth full the thar is for you and the leetle gal the boy stared at him in undisguised astonishment full too he said inexorably eat your bacon and beans and be thankful you got em there's many an empty stomach in the woods this morning joe who was readier of speech than his brother found his tongue first ain't you gonna give us any fresh meat pop no sir you ain't got loony in the night pop you don't calculate to eat half a carcass yourself do you said zebedee with a feeble attempt at a joke nope what i don't eat a lug off in the woods he's loony said joe with resignation and serving himself with bacon tilda jane was silently eating bread and beans and to her lucas addressed himself leetle gal the storms are going to conclude according to my reckoning can you foot it out on snowshoes this morning to the nearest house do you suppose yes sir she said quietly and you two boys will keep her company said lucas turning to his sons i'm a goin to march on to morse's camp there was a howl of dismay from joe you give me your word zebedee was to go and i give you my word now that you're to go said his father sternly in an hour i'll make tracks you two wait till the last flake's settled then take the leetle gal and get her out safe and sound to william mercer's ask him to hitch up and take her over to nicotoo station and i'll saddle with him then you skedaddle for home get out your books and tomorrow go to school this time there was a simultaneous howl from the boys and in the midst of their distress could be heard faintly articulating the words pop books school lucas turned to tilda jane yes we're poachers leetle gal and when i ask ye to say nothing about what ye have seen and heard here i know you'll keep as mum as we do i'm a poacher 
and i'm going to have a hard time to give it up they used to call me king of the poachers till another feller come along smarter nor i was anyway i can't give it up yet it's in my blood now and men as old as i be don't repent easy it's when you're young and squishy that you repents but these two cubs of mine and he eyed his boys with determination has got to give up evil ways right off you've got to go to school sons and learn something and quit poaching and, and having the law hanging over ye all the time the boys looked ugly and rebellious and perceiving it he went on come on none of that when you're respectable hard-working men you'll be ashamed of your father and that'll be my punishment if i don't get out of this and you needn't kick cause i'll lick you all to splinters if i catches one of you in the woods this spring you gotta turn right around i'll turn right around and come back said zebedee bitterly and furiously lucas got up took him by the coat collar and without a word let him outside the cabin a few minutes later they returned both flushed lucas grim and determined and zebedee sulky and conquered hear you also craven for an argument asked lucas ironically of joe i'm craven to lick you said the boy bursting out into a wild raven and swearing at him swearing when there's ladies present said his father seizing him by the shoulder and dragging him the way his brother had gone tilda jane stopped eating and sat miserably with downcast eyes she felt dimly that she had made trouble in this family and brought additional misfortune upon herself but what kind of escorts would these whipped boys be lucas's tussle with joe was a longer one than the former with zebedee had been and not until after some time did he return joe hung about outside for an hour then he came in shaking and stamping the snow from him and as if nothing had happened sat down and finished his breakfast lucas meanwhile had been making preparations for his long tramp tilda jane watched him with interest as he took a sack tied a potato in each corner and proceeded to fill it with parcels of provisions when at last he sat down took off his cowhide moccasins and began to tie on soft moose moccasins fit for snowshoeing he addressed his two boys when parents tell their children things air to be did they ought to be did when the children raves and tears they ought to be licked and when the lickin's over the reasons come air ye sign either ye to see the inside of state prison air ye zebedee no sir said the boy shortly air you joe joe with his mouth full of beans replied that he was not well that's where you land if you don't quit breaking state's law ye ain't either one of ye as clever as i be but i've got to try to give it up too i've been feelin that ye'd get caught some day and i've made up my mind and i'll hold it to my dying day i'm gonna crowd ye out of this risky game if i catch one of you after deer again i'll give ye up to the warden myself i swan i will and he brought his hand down energetically on the table now you go home go to school with smart boys and gals till summer vacation and then you can tell me what you think of it i'll not pretend i'll let ye out of it if you don't like it but i guess you will you've been to school before and made good progress and i asks your pardon for taking ye out zebby listened in quiet resentfulness but joe who possessed a more volatile disposition and who having satisfied his hunger was comparatively good-natured remarked what'll you do about poacher pop lucas's face darkened suddenly and unhappily come here old boy he said and when the dog went to him 
he bowed his head for a minute over him we've been good friends me and you many's the trap i led you in and many a time my heart would have been a sore if you'd have been a caught and now count of my transgression you're a wandering sheep you'll never get back in the field again unless some good sheep leads you there's something you can't make over said zebedee briefly he'll chase deer as long as he can wag a leg leetle gal said lucas suddenly would you like to hev this dog to have him that beauty dog tilda jane gasped confusedly oh sir you'd never give him away i'd most as soon give a child away said lucas and i'd never do it if it warn't for his habits you're a goin to siscasset which is something of a place and a ways from the woods and you'll pet him and kind of cherish him and keep him from frettin and bein lonely my old woman don't set much store by dogs and when i'm workin in the tannery he's off doggin deer by himself he's nearly got shot dead see those ripples in his back that's where he's been grazed poacher old boy you've got to go with this leetle gal if she'll hev you tilda jane hesitated stammered looked into the dog's anxious face and the boy's protesting ones and said at last but the old man where i'm going maybe he'll breach at my having two dogs probably he will said lucas but you crowd right up to him folks is queer about dogs them as don't like em don't want to give em standin room on this airth but you walk right up to em and say this dog has as good a right to a place on god's footstool as you have and i'm going to see he gets it if you was more like a dog yourself you'd be more thought of ye cross-grained cranky old skillingsby come you sons quit that scowlin do ye know why i'm giving that dog to the little gal stiddy you he uttered a brief negative cause she knows dog language said lucas dropping his voice to a whisper and looking mysteriously over his shoulder and if there was a deer here you'd find she no deer talk you sons is fond of dogs but not in the style a leetle gal is or ivy it's a kind of smartness at getting inside the animal skin he don't verily talk he just understand him without talk leetle gal what's poacher saying now oh he don't want to go with me burst out tilda jane with energy he's a sick dog look at his eyes and his droopin ears he don't want you to give him away he don't want me to take him oh i can't and she buried her face in her hands as if to hide temptation from her he's gotta go said lucas stroking poacher's head and mine dog and he put his hand under the dog's jaws lifted them so he could look in his eyes no running away from siscasset ye stay with that leetle gal don't you come chasing round here cause if you do i'll turn my back on ye for a runaway and you'll feel worse than you do now when we part on speaking terms say is it a bargain old feller call him leetle gal tilda jane was overawed by lucas's determined manner and dropping her hands she ejaculated feebly here poacher poacher the dog looked at her then pressed closer to his master whereupon lucas seized a stick by the fireplace and struck him sharply poacher turned his large brown eyes on him in one despairing reproachful glance then with drooping head sauntered across the room to the boys call him said lucas to tilda jane speak up as if ye knew he was your dog poacher she said in a firm voice come here you're most as unhappy as i be 
we'll be unhappy together the suffering animal moved slowly toward her and laid his head on her lap there were tears in his eyes and the little girl groaned as she wiped them away end of chapter 11 recording by john brandon chapter 12 of tilda jane this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon tilda jane by marshall saunders chapter 12 farewell to the poachers lucas was ready to start and tilda jane and the boy stood in the doorway watching him tie on his snowshoes now sons he said straightening himself up and drawing on his woolen mittens i'm going one way and you another but if ye act contrary and pouty to that leetle gal i'll know it for she's going to write me and if there's any complaint there'll be such a wallopin as these ones this morning would be a shatter and a dream to his lecture over he looked over his shoulder and narrowly inspected the faces of his two boys they were reserved almost expressionless it might be a month before he saw them again he forgot tilda jane for an instant sons you know your pop loves you don't you his tone had suddenly changed and the two big boys ran to him as if they still were children pop can't we come back after we take her out they exclaimed with backward jerks of their heads toward tilda jane their hands were on his arms and they were roughly fondling his shoulders these two unmannerly cubs of his sons he said in a broken voice i ain't been a good father to ye i've got to spend the last of my life and rootin' up the weeds I sowed the fust pot. I don't want you to have such a crop. Now you go long out and be good sons. Your mother'll be sot up, and you mind what she says, and I'll soon come home. Take good care of the little gal. And passing his hand first over one brown head, and then over the other, he tramped away out of view among the snowy spruces the boys and tilda jane went back into the cabin the two former sat together by the fire and talked taking little notice of her all their friendliness of the evening before was gone yet they were not openly unkind but simply neglectful toward noon the snow ceased falling as lucas had predicted the sun came out brilliantly and they began making preparations for departure zebedee was to wear an old pair of snowshoes that had been left in the cabin and tilda jane was to put on his new ones her humility and unselfishness slightly thawed the boy's reserve and when they at last started her ridiculous attempts at snowshoeing threw them into fits of laughter zebedee carried the infirm gippie who otherwise would have sunk to his neck in the snow poacher soberly plunged his way along while joe assisted tilda jane in keeping her equilibrium after an hour's travel she had become quite expert in the art of taking wide steps and no longer needed his helping hand ere we most there she asked in the span of another hour and a half said joe the hour and a half went by they tramped on under the serene blue of the sky and in such a solemn stillness that it seemed as if never a bird nor beast could have inhabited this white wilderness only the voiceless silent trees were there clad all in white like ghosts of departed living things but at last their winding way through the wood came to an end and they stepped out on the old road here were evidences of travel a few teams had passed by and there were snowshoe tracks alongside those of the sleigh runners 
the trees also grew more sparsely and soon gave place to clearings then the distant roof of a barn appeared and finally a long thin string of small farmhouses winding down a bleak road before them is this your home asked tilda jane of the boys nop answered joe we live off in that way and he pointed down a road to the left but well, we've got to take you here to the mercers pop said he drew up before the first in the string of houses a poor enough place and unspeakably chilling in the deadly whiteness a tiny white house a white barn a white fence a white cow in the yard white snow over everything looks as if they'd all died and gone to heaven thought tilda jane with a shiver hold on said joe i'll run ahead and see if the folks is home ain't no smoke coming out of the chimney he swung open the gate hurried in pounded at the front door pounded at the back door and finally returned guess there must be a funeral or something all off anyway what'll we do zeb zebedee shrugged his shoulders suppose we go next door but them's the falcots objected joe suppose they be well you know guess they can drive as well as mercer's folks what would pop say it's nearer than the next house i'm kind of tired said tilda jane politely and vainly just drop me and you go back i'll find someone Nop, nah, said joe firmly we promised pop come on said zebedee let's try the full cuts they went slowly on to the next blot on the landscape this one a low-roofed red house with untidy windows and a feeble wavering line of smoke rising from the kitchen chimney they all went round to the back door and in response to their knock a slatternly woman appeared what do you want boys pop says will you take this gal to nicotoo station asked joe he'll square up with you when he comes out the woman looked tilda jane all over the roads is main heavy tilda jane leaned up against the doorpost and the woman relented i guess it won't kill our hoss she remarked is it the seven o'clocker you want tilda jane appealed to the boys yes ma'am responded joe promptly needn't start for an hour yet come on in boys i guess we'll be going on home said zebedee joe for some reason or other seemed reluctant to leave tilda jane he carefully lifted gippy to a resting place by the kitchen stove untied tilda jane's snowshoes and strapped them on his back stroked poacher repeatedly and finally with a hearty so long little gal let's hear from you he made her an awkward bob of his head and ran after his brother who had reached the road tilda jane drew up to the stove and while she sat drying her dress looked about her what a dirty kitchen the log cabin she had just left was neatness itself compared with this place pots and pans were heaped in a corner of the room the table was littered with soiled dishes the woman herself was unkempt frowsy and dispirited in appearance she was also cunning for while she seized a broom and stirred about the accumulation of dust on the floor she inspected the little girl with curious furtive glances you been stoppin with the lucases she asked at last she opened the door and while she looked one way she carelessly tried to sweep in another way the pile of rubbish she had collected yes ma'am said tilda jane wearily how's miss lucas tilda jane paused to gaze out the open door why did not the woman shut it and why when it was so pure and clean without did she not feel ashamed to keep so dull and untidy a house if it were summer time and the ground was brown and green this dun-colored room would not be so bad but now the contrast made her sick how's miss lucas repeated her hostess in a dull voice i don't know replied tilda jane miss Folcott poised herself on her broom and with a rustic deliberation weighed the statement just made then she said she ain't gone away i don't know said tilda jane i never see her in my life here was a puzzle 
and mrs folcott pondered over it in silence until the draught of chilly air made her remember to close the door are we to start soon inquired tilda jane after a time i ain't a-goin to take you said her hostess unamiably it's uzziah uzziah she went to an open stairway leading from the kitchen what your want came back in an impatient tone you're wanted passenger for the station a boy speedily appeared tilda jane was not predisposed in his favour as he came lumbering down the staircase and she was still less so when he stood before her he had his mother's sharp face lean head and cunning eyes and he was so alarmingly dirty that she found herself wondering whether he had ever touched water to his face and hands since the winter began go hitch up and take this gal to the station said his mother in feeble command he stood scrutinizing tilda jane who fur bob lucas how much'll he gimme i don't know he'll pay when he comes out suppose the warden catches him he ain't been catched yet he's goin' to so they say at the post office i've got fifty cents said tilda jane with dignity here it is and she laid it on the table the youthful fox snatched it up and grinned at his mother as he pocketed it say that ain't fair remarked tilda jane you ain't carried me yet she's right said the more mature fox give it back Uzi. uzziah unwillingly restored the coin to tilda jane now go hitch up said his mother he sidled out of the room and disappeared and mrs folcott's covetous eye wandered over tilda jane's wearing apparel say sissy that's a pooty fair shawl you took off in your dog i always favor stripes so do i replied tilda jane and and with a premonition of what was coming she turned her head and gazed out the window i guess you might as well square up with us said the slatternly lady seating herself near her caller and speaking in persuasive accents and then you'll not have to be beholden to bob lucas it's just as well for a nice little gal like you to have no dealings with them lucases that shawl ain't mine said tilda jane sharply this statement did not seem worth challenging by the woman for she went on in the same wheedling voice you'll not have no call for it on the cars i can lend you something for the dog to ride down in it's too good for wrapping him and she gazed contemptuously at gippie tilda jane drew in her wandering gaze from the window and fixed it desperately on poacher who was lying under the stove winking sadly but amiably at her was no one perfect lucas hunted deer this good dog helped him his boys were naughty this woman was a sloven and a kind of thief her boy was a rogue and she herself tilda jane was a little runaway girl you can have this tippet she said sternly that shawl's got to be sent back to where it comes from oh you stole it did you said the woman with a sneer well i guess we can hitch up for no thieves and she got up and moved deliberately toward the door as if she would recall her son tilda jane's nimble fancy ran over possibilities she had fallen among sharpers she must be as sharp as they her offensive manner fell from her look here she said bluntly i ain't got one mite of money but that fifty cent piece if your boy'll drive me to nicotus right off i'll give him that as i said and i'll send back the shawl by him but if you don't want to do it speak right up and i'll move on to the next house and she continued boldly as she saw consent on the cunning face you've got to give me something to eat and drink with it cause i've got two dogs to take care of and i don't want to get to ciscasset and tumble over from being fainty mrs Volcott's gray face became illumined by a silly smile there was not a shawl like that in the settlement and bustling to her feet she stroked it and felt it with admiring fingers until admonished by tilda jane that time was passing and if she was going to get her anything to eat 
she better be quick about it the little girl almost choked over the sloppy tea from the venerable teapot the shady bread and butter and the composite dish of preserves set before her yet resolutely shutting her eyes she ate and drank and forced gippie to do the same poacher would touch nothing don't you know them hunting dogs eats only once a day said mrs Fulcott contemptuously end of chapter twelve recording by john brandon chapter thirteen of tilda jane this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon tilda jane by marshall saunders chapter thirteen an attempted trick how fur are we from nicotus inquired tilda jane of her charioteer one hour later a matter of a mile he replied beating his disengaged hand upon his knees he was sulky and cold and tilda jane averted her glance from him to his small brown nag who was trotting along as cheerfully as if there were a reward at the end of the drive for him he was a curious little horse surely there never before was one with such a heavy coat of hair he looked like a wild animal and with gladness of heart she noted his fat sides the folcots might be mean and untidy but they certainly were good to this faithful friend and her mind went off in puzzled reflection she was pursuing the same line of thought of an hour before no one was perfect yet no one was wholly bad there was good in everybody and everything poacher was a bad dog in some respects and she cast a glance at him as he came trotting sleek and thoughtful behind the sleigh but what a noble character he was in other respects gippy was a crank and she pressed closer the small animal beside her but he had his good points and he was certainly a great comfort to her her heart was much lighter now that she was drawing nearer to the train that was to take her to ciscasset and in raising her little weary head gratefully to the sky she noted in quick and acute appreciation an unusually beautiful sunset the colors were subdued the sky was as hard and as cold as steel but how clear how brilliantly clear and calm she would have fine weather for her arrival in her new home she was glad that she was not to stay here she felt herself quite a travelled orphan now and somewhat disdainfully classed through rough settlement as backwoodsy the houses were uninviting and far apart the roads and yards were desolate the men were in the woods the women and children were inside huddling around the fires middle marsden was a quiet place but it had not seemed as much out of the world as this she hoped his cassett would be cheerful her travels had given her a liking for meeting new faces and for enjoying some slight excitement not as much as she had had during the last few days no not as much as that it was too trying for her and she smiled faintly as she called up her last vision of her little careworn face in the cracked looking-glass in the log cabin what's the matter she asked abruptly the sleigh had come to a sudden standstill and the boy was holding the lines in dogged silence why don't you drive on she asked now you just looky here he replied in a rough and bullying tone i ain't a goin one step further i most froze and the station's right ahead you follow your nose a spell and and you'll get thar give me the shawl and fifty cents and get out for one moment tilda jane sat in blank amazement then she looked from his dirty obstinate face to the plump pony the latter showed no signs of fatigue 
he could go for miles yet if he had made a plea for the harness she would not so much wondered for it was patched and mended with rope in a dozen places then her blood slowly reached boiling point she had stood a good deal from these folcots the shawl was worth five dollars that she knew for she remembered hearing the matron tell how much it had cost her she had overpaid them for this drive and she was not prepared to flounder on through the snow and perhaps miss her train her mind fertile in resources speedily hit upon something she must get this bully out of the sleigh and she fixed him with a glance more determined than his own he had on a rough homespun suit of clothes and a homemade cap to match it this cap was pulled tightly over his ears but it was not on tight enough to resist tilda jane's quick and angry fingers plucking it off she threw it over a snake fence into a snowbank saying at the same time if you're gonna turn me out i'll turn you out first the boy was furious but the cold wind smote his head and postponing retaliation he sprang first for his cap shouting warningly however as he swung his leg over the fence i'll make you pay for this you tilda jane neither heard nor cared for the offensive epithet applied to her with feet firmly braced both hands grasping the lines gippy beside her and poacher racing behind she was sweeping down the road she had never driven a horse before in her life but she adored new experiences and she had carefully watched every motion of the young lout beside her he could scarcely believe his eyes he gaped speechless for a few minutes for the sound of the sleigh bells had made him turn sharply as he was picking up his cap then he restored the covering to his head ran to the fence and bawled helplessly stop thar stop stop tilda jane was skimming gaily around a turn in the road toward the sunset he thought he heard a jeering laugh from her but he was mistaken having got what she wanted she was going obliviously on her way the boy had been an obstacle and she had brushed him aside with his slower brain he was forced to pause and deliberate had she stolen their rig stupid as he was the conviction forced itself upon him that she had not she could not take the rig on the train anyway and plucking up courage and shivering in the cold that had seized upon him during his deliberations he meditatively and angrily began to plod over the route that he had recommended to her three quarters of an hour later he drew into the station yard the train had come and gone and his eager eyes went to the pony tied safe and sound under the shed with not only the lap rope over his back but also the striped shawl the first and last time that he would have the pleasure of wearing it at the sound of the bells when he turned the sleigh the telegraph operator came to the station door here's fifty cents for you left by a black-eyed girl without a thank you the boy held out his hand i guess you don't like that black-eyed girl much said the young man teasingly she's a uh, and the boy broke into an oath shut up said the young man with a darkening face then with some curiosity he went on what did she do to make you talk like that split me out replied the boy with another volley of bad language you young hound said the man witheringly if she split you out i'll bet you deserved it i'll not touch your dirty hand if you want your money go find it and throwing the fifty cents in a snowdrift he went back into the warm station and slammed the door behind him uzziah's troubles were not over and he had still to learn that the way of the transgressor is a tiresome one he fumbled desperately in the snow for he wanted fifty cents above all things in the world just then but he was destined not to find it and at last cold weary and yet with all his faults not inclined to wreak his wrath on the pony 
who stood patiently watching him he threw himself into the sleigh and sped gloomily homeward his mother had the shawl but he had nothing for his trouble for he counted as nothing and worse than nothing his experience of the maxim that one sly trick inspires another end of chapter thirteen recording by john brandon chapter fourteen of tilda jane this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon tilda jane by marshall saunders chapter fourteen home sweet home tilda jane was in a quandary she had boarded the train for sis gasset she sat up very straight and apparently very composed her outward demeanour gave not a hint of the turmoil within in reality she was full of trouble she had not a cent of money in her pocket and her new familiarity with the workings of the main central railway assured her that it did not carry passengers for nothing what was she to do she pulled the little tippet more closely around gippie's shoulders she had taken it from her own for it was absolutely necessary for him to have another covering now that the shawl was gone perhaps he would be taken away from her she had noticed that it was not a customary thing for people to travel with dogs his head and tail were plainly visible this tippet was not like the voluminous shawl lucas had not offered her money and she had not liked to ask him for it perhaps he had not thought about it perhaps if he did think of it he supposed that he was doing enough to get her to nicotus and there was the conductor entering the other end of the car she must do something and deliberately rising from her seat she slipped gippie under her arm and made her way out to the platform of the fast-moving train it was quite dark now she gave one side glance at the white silent country they were passing through then stepped into the lighted car ahead this is a smoking car young girl observed someone haughtily tilda jane had dropped into the first seat she came to which happened to be beside a very stout and very dignified gentleman who had a cigar in his mouth and who was reading a newspaper she looked round saw that there were a number of men in the car no women no children and that the atmosphere was a hazy blue smoke don't bother me she said almost scornfully what was a breath of smoke compared with her inward discomposure over her pecuniary difficulties i'm in a little trouble she said brusquely i ain't got no money to buy a ticket the gentleman gazed at her suspiciously i have no money for beggars he said and he turned his broad back squarely on her tilda jane for one so obstinate was strangely sensitive with her face in a flame of colour she rose had any one else heard the insult no not a man in the car was looking her way i'm a poor little girl she breathed over the gentleman's substantial shoulder but i'm no beggar i guess i work as hard as you do i wanted you to lend me a dollar or so to be sent back in a letter but i wouldn't take it now no not if you crawled after me on your hands and knees like a dog holding it in your mouth and precipitately leaving him she sauntered down the aisle the gentleman turned around and with an amazed face gazed after her stay there she was pausing by the seat in which was his son 
should he warn him against the youthful adventuress no he was old enough to take care of himself and he settled back in his corner and devoted himself to his paper the only person in the last seat in the car was a lad of seventeen or eighteen who was neither reading nor smoking but lounging across it while he suppressed innumerable yawns he was very handsome and he looked lazy and good-natured and to him tilda jane accordingly addressed herself she had hesitated after the rebuff she had received to apply to any of those other men with their resolved middle-aged or elderly faces this lad she was not at all afraid of and resting gippie on the arm of his seat she stared admiringly at him he straightened himself here was something interesting and his yawn ceased well miss what can i do for you he inquired mischievously as she continued to stare at him without speaking he would lend her the money she knew it before she asked him there was something else in her mind now and her little sharp eyes were full of tears is anything the matter with you he asked politely she could not answer him for a few seconds but then she swallowed the lump in her throat and ejaculated no sir only you are so pretty pretty he repeated in bewilderment yes she said in low passionate almost resentful tones you ain't got no occasion for those blue eyes and that yeller hair i wish i could take em away from you i'd have been adopted if i had em i wouldn't be standin here won't you sit down he asked courteously and with a flattered air he was very young and to have a strange child melt into tears at the sight of his handsome face was a compliment calculated to touch even an older heart than his tilda jane with a heavy sigh seated herself beside him i'm kind of put out she said languidly you must excuse me after her interest in him he could do nothing less than murmur a civil inquiry as to the cause of her concern i've been trying to borrow money she replied and i was salted to borrow money then you are short of funds yes sir she said calmly i'm a travelin but i ain't got no money to pay for me nor for this dog and his head and tail shows this time and he'll be nabbed where are you going asked the lad to Siskasset, sir if i ever get there i'm beginning to think there ain't no such place i assure you there is for i live in it myself do you she ejaculated with a flash of interest do you know a man by the name of hobart dillson rather he was my father's bookkeeper for years we pension him now he added grandly and with a wish to impress tilda jane was not impressed for she did not know what a pension was what kind of a feller is he she asked eagerly oh it's a sort of a tiger might be in a cage you know but we haven't got one big enough you mean he gets mad easy never gets on mad always stay so is a regular joke you know gonna visit him i'm gonna be his housekeeper said tilda jane with dignity the lad cast a rapid and amused glance over her small resolved figure then taking his handkerchief from his pocket turned his face to the window and coughed vigorously i can fight too she added after a pause but slowly i shan't fight him the lad did not turn around except to throw her one gleam from the corner of a laughing eye until she ejaculated uneasily there comes the conductor are you going to lend me some money his face reappeared quite sober now well young lady i am not a capitalist but i think i can raise you a loan how much do you want that is where did you come on i come on at nicotus and 
i have another dog in the baggage car travelling with two dogs he murmured and short of funds you have courage i like some animals better and some people observed tilda jane sententiously your sentiment does you credit he replied gravely and as the conductor approached he held out his hand i pay for this little girl and her dog in the baggage car that's a fine hound you've got the conductor observed civilly to tilda jane yes sir she replied meekly i hope he ain't scared of the train he don't like it much but some of the boys have been playing with him why and he drew back in surprise you're the obstinate young one i pointed out to the inspector the other day here you needn't pay and he put in her hand the money her new friend had just given him there was a great racket about you you needn't have run away from vanceboro if you'd spoken the truth you'd have saved yourself and us a lot of trouble however i guess they'll be glad to hear you're all right i'll be obliged if you'll give my respects to mr jack she said steadily i'll do it said the conductor and tell him you've picked up another dog and with a wink at her companion he passed on accept my thanks she said after a time handing the loose change in her lap to the lad keep it he replied generously i don't want it a grim flash like a streak of lightning passed over her dark face and he added hastily as a loan of course you may need money for your dogs old hobart will begrudge them a bone i assure you she thanked him and thoughtfully tied the money in a corner of her handkerchief now if his son were home he would be different hank is a rattling good-natured sort of a fellow no principle you know but not a tiger by any means i thank you sir to keep a stiff tongue when you're talking of hank dillson observed tilda jane severely he's done me favors and you'd better keep your tongue off his father too if you're dying to pitch into someone pitch into that selfish old tub reading that big paper up there he turned his back on me when i hinted round him for a loan of a dollar or so and i'll thank you to keep a stiff tongue when you speak of that gentleman said the lad smartly for he's my father your father echoed tilda jane in astonishment yes ma'am did he once have blue eyes and curly hair i believe so he's a good-looking man yet he's a uh, began tilda jane hurriedly then she stopped short law me i'll never learn to forgive folks before the sun goes down i'm getting wickeder and wickeder what's your name sir i'll want to send you this money soon's i earn some my name is datus waysmith and my father is the biggest lumber merchant on the ciscasset river is he she said wistfully and have you got more family yes i have a mother as pretty as a picture and three sisters and you have a nice room with a fire that ain't boxed up and you sit around and no other folks come in and no bells ring for you to get up and do something we have loads of rooms in our house said the lad boastfully it's the biggest one in ciscasset you'll soon find out where we live here we're most in i sparrow next then home and he flattened his face against the glass outside in the dark night bright lights appeared danced over the snowy country then disappeared the train was running through the outskirts of a prosperous town is ciscasset a nice place asked tilda jane wistfully slowest old place that ever was i'd like to live in bangor or portland there's something going on there we've nothing but a river and mills and trees and hills not a decent theatre in the place tilda jane did not know what a theatre was and discreetly held her peace i see here we are exclaimed the boy i hope mamma will have a good supper a shadow overspread tilda jane's face and seeing it the boy said impulsively 
stop here a minute i want to speak to papa and he rushed away the little girl sat still they were going more slowly now and all the men in the car were standing up putting on coats and warm caps she had no wrap but her dress was thick and hugging gippy closer she felt that she should not suffer from the cold the boy was making an animated appeal to his father who was asking him short quick questions at last he gave him a brief very well and the boy ran back to tilda jane papa says you can ride with us i told him that you had no one to meet you and it would be cold comfort wandering around alone to find your way he used to think a lot of dilson but you'd better not talk to him tilda jean trailed slowly after her guide through the crowd of people leaving the train and passing through the lighted stone station to the yard outside here were drawn up a number of sleighs the boy led her to the handsomest one jump up on the box with jenks he said in a whisper curl down under the rug and i'll bring dog number two he'll run behind won't he i guess so replied tilda jane with an equally mysterious whisper and she slipped down under the soft bearskin robe in two minutes the boy came back leading poacher by a small rope i'll just tie him behind he said to make sure he's all right and here's papa he stood aside while his dignified parent got into the sleigh tilda jane from her high seat looked around once the lumber merchant and his son were down in a black valley of soft smothering furs poacher was running agreeably behind and gippie was snug and warm in her lap no one spoke during the drive and they glided swiftly through the snowy town tilda jane had a confused vision of lighted shops with frosty windows of houses with more sober illuminations then suddenly they were stealing along the brink of a long and narrow snow-filled hollow this was the ciscasset river still held by the winter covering she thought she heard a murmur of rotten ice behind her as the lumber merchant addressed his son and she was enough of a child of the state to know that a reference to the breaking up of the ice in the river was intended presently they dashed up a long avenue of leafless hardwood trees to a big house on the hill the hall door was thrown open and within was a glimpse of paradise for the homeless orphan softly tinted lights in the background illuminated and made angelically beautiful the white dresses and glowing faces of a lady and three little girls who stood on the threshold with outstretched arms the father and son welcome to these embraces had forgotten tilda jane and as the sleigh slowly turned and went down the cold avenue tears streamed silently down her cheeks where am i to take you suddenly asked the solemn coachman beside her to hobart dilson's she said in a choking voice nothing more was said she saw nothing heard nothing felt nothing of her immediate surroundings she had once been taken to a circus and the picture now before her mind was that of a tiger pacing back and forth in his cage growling in a low monotonous tone always growling growling at a miserable child shrinking outside that there is dilson's cottage i think said the coachman at last tilda jane roused herself through her blurred vision a small house wavered at the end of a snowy path she wiped her eyes hastily thanked the man and slipping from her high seat ran behind the sleigh and untied poacher the man turned his sleigh and glided slowly out of sight she stood watching him till he disappeared then followed by her two dogs went reluctantly up the path End of chapter 14. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 15 of Tilda Jane. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 15 The French Family. Tilda Jane stood entranced. This was not the Dilson cottage. The coachman had made a mistake. She stood staring in the window, for this was a sight that pleased her above all other sights. Here was another family, a happy family, evidently, all gathered around a cheerful fire in a good-sized living-room. There were an old grandfather in the corner smoking a pipe, an old woman beside him with a white cap on her head, a middle-aged man cleaning a gun by the light of a lamp on the table, a middle-aged woman knitting a stocking, and a cluster of children of all ages about the grandfather, grandmother, father, and mother. Mingled with the crackling of the open fire was a very gay clatter of tongues, speaking in some foreign language. And one boy's voice soared above the rest in the words of a song that Tilda Jane was afterward to learn. Un Canadien errant, de ses foyers, she gazed at them until the sense of increasing cold checked her rapture and made her move regretfully toward the door and rap on it it was immediately opened by a brown-eyed child and held far back as if she were expected to enter can you tell me where mr hobart dilson lives oui mademoiselle murmured the child bashfully hanging her head but enter it is cold called the mother rising and coming forward stocking in hand tilda jane felt drawn toward this alluring family circle and one minute later was sitting in a chair on its circumference but come in doggie said the mother gently to poacher who stood hesitating on the threshold he came in and was greeted silently and politely by two respectable curs that rose from the hearthstone for the purpose then he lay down beside them and gratefully extended his limbs to the fire. Tilda Jane sat for a minute, looking about her without speaking. These people were not staring at her, but they were all stealing occasional curious glances in her direction. "'I'm looking for Hobart Dilsons,' she said bluntly. "'But I guess there ain't no such person, for the nearer I get, the more he seems to run off.' The mother of the family smiled, and Tilda Jane gazed in admiration at the soft black eyes under the firm brows. "'I can tell you, mademoiselle, he is nearby, even next door.' "'Oh!' murmured Tilda Jane. Then she fell into meditation. These people were foreigners, poor, too, evidently, though perfectly neat and clean. She wondered how they got into the country. "'You are immigrants?' she said, at last, inquiringly. "'French,' said the woman. "'Cajun French, sent from our country long ago. "'Our people went back. "'We returned to earn a little money. "'Too many people where we lived.' "'Did you come through Vanceboro?' asked Tilda Jane. "'The woman's liquid eyes appealed to her husband. "'He shrugged his shoulders, looked down the barrel of his gun, and said— it's a long time ago we come. I do not know. Maybe they weren't so particular, observed Tilda Jane. Let em do, came in a sepulchral voice from the fireplace. Tilda Jane stared at the old grandfather, who had taken his pipe from his mouth to utter the phrase, and was now putting it back. The house-mother addressed her. Do not fear, mademoiselle. It is the only English he knows. He means, all right. Do not anxious yourself. Be calm, very calm. Does he? murmured Tilda Jane. Then she added unwillingly, I must be going. Delay yourself a little, urged the woman, and her pitying eyes ran over the girl's drooping figure. The children go to make corn hot. Marie? And a stream of foreign syllables trickled and gurgled from her lips, delighting and fascinating her caller. A little maid danced from the fireplace to one of the tiny pigeonhole rooms opening from the large one, and presently came back with a bag of corn and a popper. "'And a glass of milk for mademoiselle,' said the woman to another child. 
Tilda Jane was presently sipping her milk, eating a piece of dark brown bread, and gazing dreamily at the fire. Why could she not linger in this pleasant home? "'You know Mr. Dilson,' she said, rousing herself with an effort, and turning to her hostess. "'But yes, we have lived next him for so many years.' "'Do you think I can keep house for him?' asked Tilda Jane wistfully. The woman hesitated, laid her knitting on her lap, and thoughtfully smoothed her tweed dress. "'You are young for that, mademoiselle, yet.' And she scrutinized Tilda Jane's dark, composed, almost severe face. "'If a girl could do it, I should think, yes, you can. He is sick, poor man. He walks not well at all. It makes him—' "'Like the evil one,' muttered her husband, clutching his gun more tightly. "'If he was a crow, I would shoot.' "'Let em do,' came in guttural tones from Grandfather's corner. The woman laughed merrily, and all anxiety faded from her face. Hark to Grandpère! It makes me feel good, so good. No one can make us feel bad if we feel not bad ourselves. Dilson is sick. He is not happy. Let us not be sick, too. Let us be happy. Allons, mes enfants, est-ce que le... And then followed more smooth syllables that Tilda Jane did not understand. She soon saw, however, that an order had been given to butter and salt the corn, and presently she was shyly but sweetly offered some by the French children. Even Poacher and Gippy had some kernels laid before them, and in the midst of her concern as to Mr. Dilson's behavior, her heart swelled with gratitude to think that she should have such good neighbors. Here all was gentleness and peace. She had never seen so kind a woman, such amiable children. Did they ever quarrel and slap each other, she wondered? "'It's getting late, ain't it?' she exclaimed at last, with uneasiness. "'I must go,' and she rose quickly. "'But you can stay all night if you desire,' said the woman, motioning toward the pigeon-holes. "'Stay, and go next door in the morning.' "'No, no, I must not,' said Tilda Jane very hastily, through fear that she might yield to so pleasant a temptation. "'But can I drop in and see you by spells?' "'But yes, yes, certainly. Come often,' said the woman." "'Come at any hour,' she said under her breath, and seizing Tilda Jane's hand in her own. "'If it is not agreeable there, at any time, run here.' "'I'm obliged to you,' said Tilda Jane gratefully. "'Much obliged. And if you want any floor scrubbed or anything done, just you run over and get me. I'll come.' And with a sturdy nod of her head she took her dogs and slipped out into the darkness. "'If agreeable, leave your dogs here till morning.' called the woman after her. The little girl shook her head. I guess he'd better see him right off. Good night, and thank you. The woman clasped her hands, and, looking up at the sky before she went into the house, murmured in her own language, Holy one, guard her from that terrible rage. End of chapter 15